Okay. I'm going to talk a bit about some weird parts of Python. This is very far away from journalism and like that whole practical stuff. Uh, most, most, most of the things I'm going to talk about are not things that you would encounter a lot. But it's fun to see those things because you can learn a lot about the language itself and so that's where we're going. Um, I'm personally working at CloudScale CH. Um, it's, we use a lot of complex technology like OpenStack and Ceph and try to simplify that stuff like companies like DigitalOcean, but for Switzerland, so if you need virtual servers in Switzerland, it's really good. Uh, <laughs> Um, I have um, two minor or major open source projects, Jedi and Jedi Vim, and they are, they have grown quite a bit. Um, I'm, it's, it's mostly auto-completion stuff and, and static analysis. And what I do there a lot of the time is I work with parsers and type inference and so on, and I really get to know the Python language well, because I have to understand it to solve that problem. I've done that for like two or three years. In the past, where I have not worked on anything else, so it was a full-time job basically for me. And it's been a lot of fun, and all of the, the, the whole talk will be Python 3, except the next slide. Um, what you can do in Python 2 is you can basically reassign true to false and what happens is that your whole program will basically stop working. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually fun stuff like that. It can give you job security if you want it. <laughs> if, if the code base is big enough and nobody sees that stuff. Um, yeah, but in Python 3, that's a keyword now. It's not possible anymore, un unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> so, but what I'm, I'm going to go through is, is a quick overview of, of the, the different ways how Python is parsed and tokenized and so on, and how the bytecode is created to, to show you how you can abuse that for, <laughs> yeah, basically to show you how you can abuse that. Uh, it's not, like for people that don't know what a tokenizer and parser is, I'm going to quickly explain that, but it's not going to be that half a year university course. I just don't have the time. <laughs> so we're going to start with the tokenizer which is basically a collection of regular expressions. And what it does is it will separate ones from strings and names and so on. You can see that here in the example, bar equals one or empty string. And if you tokenize that, you can do that with Python, dash m tokenize some name. And then you will get the output here where you have a start position, an end position, and then the type of the token and the token itself. So what you can do with this is not really a lot, but um, you can, for example, do syntax highlighting. This is what a lot of editors do because you basically have enough to highlight operators and stuff. But now the question is like, this is, this is not, my, I mean, you could, do, you could write that stuff yourself. This is not hard. But how can you abuse that in Python code? Well, can somebody tell me if this is valid Python code? It doesn't have a space in it. 
So <laughs> this is this is this is actually valid Python code. I don't know if 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 somebody ever has seen the operator chiff or like well it's 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 a bit it's it's not actually that what 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 the tokenizer does here and that's really important is the tokenizer always works from left to right top to bottom and that's where that's why you can write a br uh and then the string and br is the string prefix and then that's a token the next token is or it, it doesn't need a it doesn't need a space i mean you can write code like that and you'll be fine it's just you shouldn't uh and after or again like we're you can just write the dot because the token is finished and so on and and uh, well or the, basically the dot dot zero j is a token that's a complex number some of you might not know that you can write complex numbers in python but it's actually possible and then like after that comes an if and it's un like it's unfortunately the only place where i found in in the python grammar where you can write basically a name that is not a name because it's it's split and so yeah i mean that's a start <laughs> um so we get like the, the next step that Python uses in, internally is the parsing. And, oh, like one thing that I forgot to mention is the tokenizer. Tokenizers are not needed for all languages. In Python, it's, it's, it, it's actually needed because if you don't have it, you cannot really deal with white space. Uh, a lot of languages are just like you can just ignore the tokenizer, write a good parser with regular expressions. I think they're called pack parsers or something. Uh, I'm not an expert, <laughs> even though I work on them. That's unfortunate. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's just a detail. The parser then takes that the whole input of tokenize and builds a tree. That, that tree, I mean, you can get that tree with ast.parse code. You have to import ast first, but ast. But you pretty much get a module, and in that module you have a few statements, and in the first statement here we have r equals one or empty string. And all the other stuff is ignored because like, yeah, you don't care about the end or anything. This is, this is really where the tokenizer doesn't allow you to say this is a valid Python program. Once you have the abstract syntax tree, you know you have a valid Python program. It doesn't mean it runs, it's just valid. Um, and this is, this is also where Python generates syntax errors. So when you see a syntax error, it's always that step. The parser um, so, so I mean, it, it, it kind of looks, looks complicated. How, how would you get from the, that right side to the left side? or from the left to the right. <laughs> uh, it, but that's basically the subject for another day because it's really not that simple. It's also a bit more complicated because Python has this concept of an abstract syntax tree, but what it creates first is a syntax tree that, yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to go into it also because I I'm not an expert in that either. So what, what, 
strange things could, could happen here is stuff like this. Uh, this is C code. Is it valid Python code? Yes. <laughs> um, some of you might not know the semicolons, but they're allowed in Python. Like you can just write the next statement after that one without the new line. Uh, the thing is, plus plus one will not do the same thing like C. It's a different thing. Plus plus one is just one. Minus minus one, it's just math, it's one. Uh, if you put a bit, a bit more uh, stuff there, you can do ASCII art, for example. Uh, you, can, you can write stuff that is, well, nice to look at, doesn't do anything. The result of this expression will be one. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, it's kind of fun because, because you would think that Python is this, this beautiful language that you cannot abuse as much, but you still can somehow if you, you try. Um, another thing that I found recently is a bit more sophisticated than this stuff because this works in a lot of languages. But the other thing that I found was Lambda generators. I, I don't think anybody would ever use this because you can just write one state. Well, you could, you could somehow write multiple ones, but it's just really not clever to do this. But the thing is here, you, you start noticing a pattern um, in the parser, which is, oh, yield is not a statement. Yield is something that you can use within a statement. So you can just make brackets around it, put those two guys around yield, and you can do pretty much anything with yield as long as it's in the context of a function. And this is, this is something interesting because that I mean, you can, you can also abuse that even worse. Uh, like, you can use it as a default in a parameter. And it actually works. We, like, me and my friend, we, we, we tried. Uh, it took us a while until we, until we actually found a solution of how to use it. But <laughs> how you would actually get running code out of this, but it works. Um, and it compiles and, and so on. So, uh, yeah. But I mean, I mean, there's not there's not too much to say about it. There's this Python grammar file, and if you look at it, there's just a lot of things. I mean, there's comments in there where it's like, oh yeah, this. This is handled somewhere else, not in the, in, the, in the actual grammar. And then you just start looking around. Oh, yeah, I can, I can kind of use that stuff here. And, and, and it's just, I, it, it, for me, it started to get more fun to play with this stuff. Because, I mean, the, 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 the C Python is, C, C Python, for those that don't know, is the, the, the implementation of Python, the default implementation. And Armin, who talked here before, he wrote another implementation that is called PyPy. And C Python's code base is just really nice to read. So if, you're ever, if you ever want, want to understand how a dictionary works in Python or how, how the parser works, it's actually not that complicated to read. It's, it's written in C, it's not in Python. But it's really interesting to learn about these things. Uh, if you want to learn about PyPy, well, it's not going to be that easy, probably. But I don't, I don't know. Um, um, so we, we, we'll go to the next step, which is the bytecode generation. This is just, I think there's a lot of 
ways to abuse this as well, but it's a bit more complicated because this happens under the hood. It's not something that you would see a lot, but with by using imported this, like this in DIS, or by using it on the command line, Python dash M this foopy, you can basically disassemble a Python source file. And, and so, so if you disassemble that Python file, you will get a lot of strange stuff out of it that you will probably not understand because it's, it's Python bytecode language. It's it's, I don't know how you would even call it. It's just Python bytecode. And what you see is if we're, we're back to our example bar equals one or string. And what you see is the first thing it does is it loads zero. Why? Because bar equals zero or as a string. Or what did I say? No, I'm, I'm actually wrong here. No, it loads one, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and that's load cons. And, and, and the next thing is basically or written in a kind of different way. It's, it's, it's optimized for like those bytecode commands. There's about like, I think there's like 100 or something. 100 bytecodes, and that's basically the language below Python. And there's a language below that bytecode, and that's C. And there's a language below C, and so on. But <laughs> um, the interesting thing here is that this stuff makes Python. It's and if you, if you ever, if, I mean, it's probably not very usable mostly, but if you ever want to know a Pi C, like if there's a, only a Pi C file and no Pi file, you can just disassemble it. It's actually possible. And so this is, this is by the way, being created from the parser. Well, not from the parser, but like, it takes the parser and does this, like it, it makes it to bytecode. And then the next thing that basically happens, and this is where it starts to get interesting again, is Python has this concept of, of, of dictionaries and functions. I think Python consists mostly of, of those two. Because when you look at it, uh, what happens here is, at the end, it stores bar, store name bar. This is, this is not something you have to understand now, but it's, it's just, oh, we put something in, into a dictionary. And this is, again, something you can abuse. Because in, in, in C, you can write something like this. Uh, this is basically just reading from the, from the input not something you have to understand now. And in Python, you can do basically the same thing in a one-liner. It's also not something you would, you would do because you can just write it way simpler. But the interesting thing is you have access to globals, which is basically just a dictionary for a module. And a module, so, so basically, we can say a module is a dictionary with a bit of syntactic sugar. So that's why I, I, would, I would argue if you don't really understand dictionaries and you're working in Python, it's, it's probably the first thing you have to understand. Even like... Like, there's the same thing with locals. Well, or at least the, the concept of locals is also, it's a dictionary. If you're in a function, you have an, a new kind of dictionary and you just work from there. And the last, the, the, the basically last thing 
I, I want to show you is something about classes. And what I, what I realized is there's this, this function in the, in the standard library, under under built underscore class under under, um, that takes a function and you give it a name and it basically turns that function into a class. And it, that's, that's what Python does to convert a class to a function. Uh, the other way around. Or no, yeah. <laughs> Basically, you have a class scope. You write class foo and then something in it. And the problem that Python now has internally is do we do something different? Do we, do we, do we generate different bytecode or do we just use the same bytecode like in the functions? And what they do is they just use something very similar um, where Python just I mean, I mean, the, the problem basically here is uh, we have this function def func at the top. And this function is, it, it, it defines a few things. And that looks like a class, except there's no return statement. And that function, if you, I have, I, I had to do some, some refactoring of the, of the bytecode of that function because it, Python has some performance optimization, optimizations that we don't really want uh, here for, this, for the sake of this example. But if, if you remove that, we can, we can basically create the class from that function and say dot bar, class dot bar, and we actually get the stuff in that dictionary of that, of that class. And what we see here is, is again, like Python's concept for, for scopes and, and functions and classes and, and modules is always dictionaries. And if you, if you want to execute something, it's pretty much always functions. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a lambda or a function or a class. It just works like a function. And probably, and, and the odds are that you will never see this, this under under build class again, even though it's one of 60 functions in Python. But it, it's kind of interesting that it's there and nobody's ever seen it. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to close with this example. Um, you can get in contact with me over, well, I have GitHub and Twitter and if you want to contact me by mail, you can do that as well. And now because we have time, there's a riddle uh, down there. It's, it's a bit long, but it's actually, I think we have like, I have like five minutes left. So uh, during the question and answer time, I, you can just try to solve that riddle. Uh, Whoever is first, but there, please don't use prompts. Like it's too easy. I don't just copy it. You, you can do it in your head. It's actually possible. Just this, yeah. If you put this, into a prompt, there's going to be a result, and I don't know. It's pretty, it's pretty advanced stuff, but maybe someone will be able to do it. All right. That was weird. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do we have any questions? What oh, yeah. ah, 
sorry, maybe I just lack the proper knowledge to understand why Python is weird, but can you say it in two sentences for me? <laughs> well, I like I I wouldn't say I wouldn't say Python is generally a weird language. I'm just saying that most languages have those weird spots. And Python has them as well. Because you can write stuff like this that is actually valid Python. And and sometimes you see those people bashing languages like where they're like, oh, this is such an ugly language, and and it's some sometimes good to see that yours can be too. Like you're not actually much better <laughs> if you <laughs> if if you try. Like I think Python is a quite quite a, a beautiful language, but it's not it's not perfect either. Yeah. There's another question over there. So what about how Python 2 compares incompatible types? Do you consider that weird or not? Oh yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but, but like as I as I like that's the whole that's the whole thing. Like Python 3 cleaned up quite a lot of rough edges. There's I mean I, I in the beginning I've I've shown you I've shown you the the true false example, and and that is probably even worse. But like, I think Python three was really good ex exactly for things like that, where like, if you compare one with a string, and it's smaller, then it should raise an error and not like do something crazy like false, because that's the whole point about Python. That it's it's really strict and correct. Yeah. Another question over there. Hey Dave, have you thought Hi. about um, or have you tried using PyLint to look at some of these bugs? I mean, I'm wondering if is there like a Dave scale of Python weirdness, and could it be used in a linter and maybe even in a security scanning kind of application? Well, like. The thing is, the thing is, I'm like Pylint is actually like I, I know those guys personally, but they're they're doing pretty much what I do. Just maybe a, like they're also doing a static analysis tool, and so what I've what I've been doing in my open source project is actually. To find stuff like maybe not like this this stuff here because that's pretty obvious. Like you can just like if somebody writes stuff like this, you can just call that person out and like I don't know what you're what you're gonna say, but it's not gonna be good. And but but in terms of static analysis, you can like it gets better and better. I think in Python, Pylint is is making progress and Jedi is making progress too. It just just takes some time. It takes like it, it really takes time to write good software, I think. Open source especially. <laughs> Question here in the front. So I just wanted to ask about one of the examples you showed, yeah. the one with the yield. Doesn't yeah. yield uh, isn't it an expression because you can also put things back into the generator, like you can yeah it's an exp yeah that's that's why you can use it yeah, in, in yeah exactly. any it's an ex it's it's like if you look at the grammar file which is something i don't have here in my presentation unfortunately but if you look at the grammar file it's it's an expression but it's not a statement and that's the difference but uh, you can actually like return things into the generator by by and uh, if you do that if you call next with a Parameter, you get that parameter from the yield yeah. as yeah, a value yeah. of that yeah, expression. Yeah. yeah. Okay, just uh, one. Well, you don't get the par you, you don't get the parameter. You will like in that one example I made there. I'm sorry, if so, is, is somebody still solving this one? Not, not really, right? <laughs> the answer, the answer is a capital A. 
<laughs> uh, well, just going back there. Like you mean this one? Yeah. Right? So if you call next on this, well, you have with a parameter with yeah. some value, you will get that value in the yield. Not well, not the parameter. The thing is, you you have to push the parameter into that function with send. Like, uh, send is also something most people don't even know because... Yeah, either send or next with, with uh, additional yeah. uh, parameter to it. Yeah, and, but you don't get the parameter back, you push it in. <laughs> uh, anyways, it's, okay, yeah, just it's, wanted to clarify that. It's Thank not you. important. <laughs> Any other questions over there? Uh, I'm going back a bit to the tokenizing and um, parsing stuff. Uh, there's this nice feature in Python where you can chain uh, comparison operators. Um, like uh, you can write uh, 0 smaller than x uh, smaller than 10, uh, which also works in C but does something uh, not very useful. Um, but there, there, there are other operators that you can chain like this. Uh, do you have some insight into that? How that is actually parsed and and later uh, transformed into bytecode? Well, I think <laughs> I, I think you. I know what you're speaking about, but <laughs> without, I I think I was I was thinking about adding that as well to my slides, but I thought it wouldn't. I wouldn't have enough time. I think I'm just going to pass on this one. It's actually pretty fun because if you if you say stuff stuff like five in range uh, five in range of ten, it will say that the answer is true because five is in range of ten. But if you say five in range of t of ten equals true, it will say false because of how Python works. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a big, I think, Stack Overflow question where you can, that explains this quite well. And it's fun. Yeah. Maybe one more? No? All right, so let's thank Dave again.